So before I get started, about, I want to say like 10 years ago, I shot an email to a guy that I looked up to very much and uh, he got back to me immediately and I told him I was coming into town and I really needed some advice. I was a bit starstruck because the guy, to me, I really looked up to him and uh, as you know in this world people don't exactly get back to you quickly all the time. And he invited me in, met him, sat down at a table inside his gym and we talked for about five hours and he was not in a rush and I picked his brain and he just opened up the vault. And at one point in the conversation he took out a piece of paper with a pen and he started to map out a gym and show me what a gym should look like and why and explain it. And you know, I, I, I'm not one of those guys that thinks he has all the answers so him doing that it was a huge help and it made me feel like this is the industry I want to be in if this is what it's all about. And that guy is Dave Tate. So thank you very much for doing that because uh, a lot of people don't give up their time like that and I'll never forget that and it, it meant a whole heck of a lot uh, to me. So thank you. So to tell my story, yeah I own a gym in Miami Beach, Florida. I do have a business partner and um, I, I have to kind of lay the groundwork of, of where I'm from and I'm going to start there and I'm going to transition into the business itself and you got to hear this part first okay because it's all going somewhere just stick with me so I'm from Fall River Massachusetts and I, I gotta ask this you know Fall River are you serious holy shit let's give him a round man I'll tell you all about it that's crazy man every time I tell people I'm from Fall River they kind of look at me funny but Fall River in itself is a very interesting place I'm very proud of it but you know, a lot of uh, different social problems and, and, and it's just tough. It's a hard-nosed place and I'm sure everyone here is from a blue-collar hard-nosed place but this place, the reason I say that is a lot of the kids don't make it out. Uh, a lot of drug problems, uh, alcohol problems, substance abuse and growing up I saw a lot of that and I, I didn't understand like what I was going to do or how, to, how I could avoid that because everyone does it. Like even teachers leave school at you know 2.30 at 3 o'clock, they're sitting down in a bar and they're all drinking and I thought that was normal. So this is my mom Pauline Magna and she raised my brother and myself by herself. At six years old my father just left, decided he didn't want that job anymore and my mom was forced to take on an additional job and then a few years later another job to keep food on the table. And I pretty much owe my attitude, my work ethic and everything to this woman and her energy because she was like just a relentless, tireless worker and I remember her sitting down at this little, we called it a card table, I was going to say cod table, but card table and she would take out cash from an envelope and she'll, she'd put like $20 down, $30 on top of it, five and she said this is what we have left for the week, so what are you feeling? Like, do you want pasta? What kind of pasta? Because pasta at the time was very cheap in boxes. So we ate a lot of pasta and we're from an Italian descent. So she worked her ass off. I mean, there were many nights I came home and, and she was crying and, and trying to make ends meet. But, you know, it's why do you do what you do? Why do I do what I do? Is because I carry her name with me and it, it's a really big deal because she was my hero. I firmly believe that moms or the person that looks out for you, it could be your dad, but that parent that's the strong figure in your life, they're actually your first coaches. And uh, I learned a whole hell of a lot from my mother and you're going to see even more of that in these slides ahead. That's little Mark playing little league football. Uh, that doesn't do it justice because I was a little fat roly-poly kid, okay? And uh, I basically walked to the line of scrimmage, get my ass handed to me, and then go back to the huddle and I didn't really know what I was doing out there but I wanted to play sports and the reason I wanted to play sports is because all the men in my family, my uncles and the people close to us and people in our community respected sports. I'm from New England and sports are everything and if the Patriots win everyone's in a good mood. If the Patriots lose you don't want to go to Dunkin Donuts to get a coffee. Everyone's miserable. So I wanted to be a part of that because people kind of ignore me. I was uh, very self-conscious, insecure, young person. And um, 
I wanted to change that, but I didn't necessarily know how. But this was the start of it. I just kept showing up to play football. So this is uh, the throwback with the, I got a little gold chain going on. I think I'm cool. Uh, not there just yet, but I was still trying to find myself. And at the time I was going to school and there was a point in my life where I was getting my ass kicked every single day. I was being bullied and I hated the way I felt. And there was no male uh, role model in my family. There was no male figure. There was no one to turn to. So. I couldn't really ask for advice. There, there was no, I, I, could, I had no outlet, no one to talk to, no one had my back because my mom couldn't do it. And I was craving, like freaking craving uh, a male figure in my life, a mentor, uh, uh, a father figure. And this guy showed up. So this is Vincent Fitzgerald and um, he was the vice president, uh, vice president, vice principal of my high school. And one day he saw me hanging out with a bunch of kids who were bad kids, like not good kids. The, uh, these kids were the type of kids that, you know, ninth grade, eighth grade, they're drinking after school, they're climbing to people's windows, they're stealing expensive stuff from people's houses. And he saw me hanging with these kids and he called me over one day and he said, why are you hanging out with those kids? And I said, I'm hanging out with those kids because they're my friends. And he said, what makes you think they're your friends? And I was like, well, because we hang out and we do things. And then he looked at me and said, what type of things? And of course, I couldn't tell him. So he made, every time he saw me with those kids, he pulled me in his office and he made me stay there. And if uh, security around the school saw me hanging with those kids, they bring me to the office and I like, got detention for literally hanging out with those kids. Okay? So... I didn't really know why he was doing that, but he, had, he knew my mother and he knew what my mother was going through. Uh, he was a distant friend of a friend of the family and he really came to my rescue at a really important time in my life. And it's men like this in my life who changed the trajectory of my life, like it, it was a godsend. If it wasn't for him, I'm not even so sure I'd be standing on this stage. So, this is where it like started with sports and, and athletics and wanting to change my life, my mind, my body, my attitude. And there was a woman who lived next door in the housing project that I lived in. And she had all these magazines every day. She'd come home with bags of magazines because she worked at this plant with these, uh, this conveyor belt came through with magazines. And if there was a rip in the cover, she'd just take it. So she, one day she came over to me, she said, hey, I got some magazines, what kind of magazines do you like? I said, I love sports. She's like, perfect. She gave me this huge trash bag of magazines. So I grab the magazines, I go to the bedroom, I rip up all, all the pictures, and I plaster them all over the wall. And at any point I could tell you, you know, who the athlete is, um, you know, his stats, height, weight, whatever, where he's from, what he's good at, what he's not good at, what the scouts say, and I was just obsessed with numbers and you know, studying and knowing as much as possible about these athletes because what you're looking at right here, these are like my heroes. Like everything I did up until that point was wanting to be like these guys. And as Joe said, you know, Arnold, Joe, how old are you? 42. I'm 41 years old. I mean, the, Arnold and Rocky Balboa, forget about it. There's enough right there, right? I, I, I idolize these guys. I would literally run around Fall River in jogging pants and a sweatshirt at 4.30 in the morning thinking I was Rocky Balboa. So these were my heroes, and later on, we're at Ohio State, it's very interesting, uh, I had a connection to Andy later on uh, in life, and I'll explain that in a second. So I show up at high school football, and uh, I'm on the freshman team, I'm 5'10", I weigh 149 pounds, because I went from the roly-poly kid to hit that growth spurt, right? So now I'm a stream beam. I'm a stream beam, and I'm, I'm starting to lift weights, my grandfather showed me how to lift weights at the local boys club. Uh, I trained my, so every year, every day after school, my mother went to uh, a place called Bodybuilding Plus with a brown paper bag. And she said, I want my son to join for six months. I think at the time they took like $125 from her. And she said, you better show up every day. And I would walk from school to Bodybuilding Plus. That's right, Bodybuilding Plus. And that's, that was my hobby. 
every single day I went to the gym and the people in the gym became like a bunch of dudes that looked out for that young kid in the corner who didn't know what the fuck he was doing. So they would walk over and say, hey, do this, do, do this with me, Mark. And they would look out for me. So I was building like this tribe of people who didn't even know my name, but they knew that I was a kid showing up every day after school to work hard at something he didn't know much about. So they kind of took me in. And, and, and I grew. I, I wasn't a very good football player. I was very average. Uh, and I remember my coach, Bob Bogan, telling me, you know, Mark, you have to go all out all the time because you're not very good. And I said, well, what does that mean? He goes, you have to give 100% effort and empty the tank. The only way you're gonna be good at this is to give every ounce of energy in your body. So on the field in practice, I would go hard all the time, like they're running through drills and it's a walk through and I'm spiking the ball out. And like, this kid's an asshole. But that's what the coach told me to do. And this, I believed, I believed that I was gonna be a great football player. The reason I believed that is because when I was born, Dr. Jean LaMere told my mother, your son is big, has big bones. He's gonna play in the NFL. And my mother looked at him and said, what's the NFL? <laughs> he said, like the Patriots, he's gonna play for the Patriots. And every single day of my life, my mother told me, you're gonna play for the Patriots. I don't even think she knew what that meant, but she told me every single day. So believing that, she programmed it in my head, I would do anything and everything to train for football. I remember training in the parking lot, I remember training on the field, I remember copping the fence and getting a scar on my ass from the, the fence, ripping into my shorts because it was locked and I wasn't supposed to be in there. And I grew from 149 pounds to uh, my sophomore year is about uh, 180, 185, then 215. My senior year was 230 pounds. And I wasn't good, but I did have a reputation for going hard, as I told you before. And in my senior year, a coach came to my game to watch the running back for the other school. His name was Garth Kamara. Garth Kamara was really fast, speed demon. And on this play, I'll never forget, this, this play literally gave me the opportunity of a lifetime. So Joe's the running back, because I know he's a great athlete. Joe's the running back. He gets a toss this way. I take a false step because I'm playing linebacker. I went this way. The offensive lineman cut my feet. I went right on my face. I said, what the fuck? I got up. I started sprinting downfield. I was running full speed, running full speed, knowing I'm not going to make the play. I ran about 50 yards downfield. I dove with my eyes closed, and I pulled the kid out of bounds from a horse collar, which was legal back then, right? <laughs> and that coach saw it and said, literally, he told me a story later on, you don't see that every day. Because I was always going hard, and I gave this insane effort, and that effort was laying the groundwork for the rest of my life. Right after the game, he walked down to the locker room and he said, my name is Jim Reed. I'm the head coach of the University of Richmond. You have a full scholarship at the University of Richmond. And I said, um, I said, we can't afford that. <laughs> and my high school coach said, Mark, he's gonna pay for it. And then I said, well, where is that? And he said, it's in Virginia. So I went home and I told my mother, I just got a scholarship to go to college. And my mother said, who told you that? <laughs> and I said, Coach Reed, this guy, the head coach of Richmond. And she called Coach Bogan. She said, someone told Mark he has a scholarship. I mean, I don't think that's nice. It's not funny. And, and I, said, I said, Mrs. Megna, your son has a full scholarship to the University of Richmond. So you can only imagine, like, that was a really special moment because I was the first person in my family to have any education after high school. So and I had no other scholarship offers, so I went to the University of Richmond, and uh, it was really exciting. This is the guy, Jim Reed, and I got to Richmond. I'm a linebacker, and I'm, I'm prototypical. I was like 6'1", 6'2", 230 pounds. He called me in his office. He goes, I'm so happy you're here. You're going to have a great career here. You're a nose guard. 
I said, excuse me? He goes, you're going to play nose guard. I said, I, I don't, you know, I don't have that. Like, that's not me. He said, you're going to be great at it. Get out of my office. Shut my door. I said, this, this isn't even funny. This is not good. This is a real big problem because we know what nose guards look like, right? And I did not look like that. And after running in the offseason, the, the preseason program, Richmond Heat, I was about 214 pounds, and I was not a nose guard. Nevertheless, they put me there, and I was having an awful time on the field. I was having an awful time in school, getting my ass kicked on the field. I wasn't playing. I was like fourth string nose guard for the University of Richmond, who was probably the worst team in one AA. And in school, I had a 1.6 GPA, and I wanted to get the fuck out of there. I couldn't wait to get out. And I called my mother, and I said, this is not working out. I have to come home. I'm not meant to do this. I'm failing in school, on the field. I'm never going to play, and I'm, I'm embarrassed. And there was, bless you, there was dead silence. And my mother told me, look, you can come home right now. You can come home right now, and I'll never mention this to you for the rest of your life. But I'm going to tell you one thing. If you come home right now, you are going to kick yourself in the ass every day for the rest of your life. She says, you can do this. You're just as good as anyone else. It doesn't matter what I think. You have to believe in yourself. All I'm asking you to do is do the best you can. Give great effort like you always have, and everything will be fine. I hung up the phone. I just, it was like a rebirth. My mom wrote me a letter. On that letter, she said, I believe in you. I love you. A lot of emotional things about our lives and things she went through. My mom tried committing suicide twice. Every time she came out of it, she said, I can't let my boys down. And um, at the end, she wrote, dream big, never quit. So I took that and I put it in my locker and I saw it every day before practice. And you can only imagine what kind of fucking bulletin board material that is, right? It got me so fired up every day and I really, really started to transform into something special. That's freshman, that's like 214, young buck. And at the time, when I got moved to defensive line, introduced this guy. Does anyone know who this guy is? Joe, you might know who this guy is. This guy right here. <laughs> so, has anyone seen the movie Whiplash? Raise your hand if you've seen the movie Whiplash. So, you know the instructor, the teacher, right? This guy makes that teacher look like a pre, like a choir boy. Like, this, he's a, this is Joe Cullen. He's been in the NFL. He's one of the a legendary NFL D-line coach, and he was my coach. And I'll tell you something, he made me want to quit football every single day. Because he rolled me, he's like Bobby Knight on steroids. He was nuts. And, but Joe Cullen, the great thing about Joe Cullen is that if a position coach didn't want you, he wanted you. He's like, I'm going to make this kid a star. How did he do it? He busted your ass and rode your ass. And when you had to redo a rep, he didn't make you do it once, twice, three times. He made you do it 15, 20 times in a row. So when they snapped the ball in that game, it was like, bam, spin right into a TFL. So guys were having five, six, seven TFLs in a game, and they were like, how the fuck are these kids making plays, and where do they come from? It was because of him. Like, we gave great effort, but he would get fucking water from a rock, really. So knowing that, I mean, I went from a kid who barely got a scholarship to uh, a pretty good player. And that, that's the note from my mom. Uh, that's actually the, the stick She had stick uh, those yellow posts all over the house. And that's me getting excited, celebrating at the University of Richmond my senior year. I go through my senior year and um, all of a sudden scouts are showing up. And I realize they're showing up for Mark Megna. And I don't understand what's happening because I'm such a long shot from a small school. And everyone's going, now it's, you are way too small to be a defensive lineman. This kid can be a linebacker. And I'm like, no shit. That's what I came to school for, right? <laughs> so now they're like, well, the NFL guys think I can, but you guys thought I can't. That's a long story. Anyway, I train in the offseason. 
Uh, very similar story. I lived in a very small confined area in the off season. I worked my ass off. There was no pro combine programs, none of that shit. I trained myself. I went to the library. I gave them my driver's license. They gave me a video camera. I set that video camera up and I watched every single piece of that pro shuttle. Every single piece of the 40 yard dash start time. I didn't have anyone training me aside from the strength coach who would throw me some drills here and there. He'd say, do this. And I literally trained myself. And 225, whenever the scouts showed up, I had to do 225. I had to do 225 bench press tests every single day. Talk about tearing a pec, right? So I did everything I could because I'm like, man, this is possible. This is really possible. I believe in myself. We're going to see what happens. On draft day, in that confined area, there was one phone right there on the floor, a little mattress. Um, first round, first day, I'm outside playing basketball. I come inside, second day, phone rings, I pick up the phone. I said, may I please speak to Mark Megna? I said, this is Mark Megna. He said, son, do you know who this is? The odd thing is that I really believed I knew who it was. I never talked to him, never heard his voice before. He said, don't let the pitcher throw you. He said, this is Bill Parcells, I'm the head coach of the New York Jets. And when I heard that, I almost started to like shake because I was so excited and emotional. And he said, I believe you can play linebacker for us in New York. Can you do that for me, son? I said, yes, sir. Can you rush the passer on third down? I said, yes, sir. He said, can you play special teams for us? I said, sure, why not? Right? <laughs> so he said, we're going to take you with this next pick. Welcome to the New York Jets. I hung up the phone, very emotional moment, immediately called my mother, we're all crying tissues, and I went to New York. I was only in New York a very short time, um, through the preseason, beginning of the season, and then I was released, and I was pissed and embarrassed. But it was a godsend because the next day, I was picked up by the New England Patriots. So it worked out, and that doctor was right. So. I, I, moved, I went from the Jets, Patriots, Bengals back to the Patriots, played for Bill Parcells, uh, Bill Belichick, uh, Pete Carroll. Um, you know, and it's funny because everything that I learned was prepping me for my business. The way you run an organization, the way you treat people, the way you treat teammates, the way you treat staff, the way you're on time, punctuality, everything you do, I was getting a crash course on how to run a business from some of the greatest minds in the NFL. And it was incredible. And I had no idea what was going on, but I was just getting immersed in this knowledge. Uh, this is just first year on the practice squad, and then when I was called up and made the team. And I'll tell you what, um, in the locker room, Willie McGinnis, you guys know Willie McGinnis is? You heard of him? So Willie McGinnis, I would sit right next to him, and he'd say, hey, Mark, how are you feeling today? I'd say, I feel pretty good. He goes, good. Because see those four guys they just brought in to get equipment? They're here to take your spot. So if you don't have a good day, you're going home. And I'd be like, so to me, everyone, you know, you know, they go through the motions in practice and then you play hard in the game. Dude, practice was a game for me. I had to go hard. I had to be the first one down to kick off. I had to do everything perfectly or they were sending me home because I was definitely not a star. So played in the uh, NFL, uh, went to NFL Europe, back to the NFL, NFL Europe, back to the NFL. Then I went to uh, Canada, played from 2002 to 2006 for the Montreal Alouettes, played for the Berlin Thunder in Germany, played for the Barcelona Dragons in uh, uh, Barcelona. And then I hooked up with the supplement company and they started to pay me just to be in ads. And I thought that was really cool at the time. I thought it was really cool at the time because this was one of my heroes and I wanted to be like him. Look, obviously that picture is a little distorted. I just want everyone to know that, I'm gonna be honest. And, uh, Ironically, this guy's birthday is July 30th. That's my birthday as well. But I thought this was really cool, but I realized this is not what I wanted. It was a dream of mine to be on that magazine. Uh, no, no joke. Of course it was. But this was not what I wanted. I wanted something bigger. I had a grand vision, and it was about helping people, sure. But it gets better. I, when I'm done playing football, I get a job at a place called Equinox Fitness. You know Equinox? 
Heard of it? Of course, right? Equinox Fitness, global gym, very successful luxury gym, and I'm working there. The first day I'm there, the manager walks over to me, he says, Mark, come here for a second. He goes, I want you to clean the floor. And he throws a towel at me. And I was like, man, as I'm thinking of creative ways to kill this gentleman, <laughs> I'm thinking, I have two options. I can act like, you know, I stick my ego into it and say, I have too much pride for this, or I can handle this like I handle everything else. So I got down on my knees and I started scrubbing the floor right in front of him. And I kept getting water and scrubbing the floor all over the floor. And he looked at me and said, what the hell are you doing? I said, you told me to clean the floor. He says, yeah, but I said, yeah, but we're going to need some sort of buff and shiner because this floor looks like shit. I don't know who was responsible for it before, but I'm responsible for it now. And this thing's going to shine. He looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, look, you asked me to clean the floor. This is how I do things. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to fucking do it right. So working at Equinox, as I'm working at Equinox, I, I, I want to train athletes and work with athletes. So a sports agent friend of mine got me a meeting with Pete Bomarito. I started work with Pete Bomarito. And Pete didn't pay me, and that was fine because it was an honor to work there. He said, you're going to intern. And I was a fucking hard-working intern. I mean, I worked. I was 31 years old, and I worked nonstop, around the clock. I did that for uh, two and a half years. So I'm working at Equinox at the same time I'm working at Bomberito Performance, at the same time um, training private clients. And I picked up a, cl a client, a Jewish woman from the uh, Jewish area in Miami, and I said, you don't have to pay me, right? Just like Joe, you don't have to pay me. I don't want you to pay me. I want you to see real results first. When you feel I'm fit to receive pay and you like the results, then you can pay me. So I don't really have any clients at Equinox. I'm not getting paid at Bomb Rate of Performance. I'm not getting paid from this woman. And I just trained her. I mean, I probably trained her 50 times before I got any money. I worked there for two years before I got any pay. And it was fine with me because I wanted to show them that I knew what I was doing. And I wanted to be over the moon because they were training with Mark Megna. So finally, I showed up one day at that woman's house and she gave me a check for $5,000. And she said, I was going to work those sessions off, man. And uh, it was a great day because I finally had some money. I had spent all my earnings on my family from the NFL. I wasn't uh, the wisest investor. And then... I started to get a reputation for doing things right and working very hard. And I got a call um, from this guy and he said, can you fit me in to train me every single day? I said, sure. I said, what's your name? He said, my name's Alex. I said, great, Alex. What do you do? He said, I play baseball. Okay. Where, where do you play baseball? Softball down Flamingo Park in Miami? He goes, I play for the Yankees. I said, oh, I think I know who I'm talking to. Sure. I'm like, my wife, my uh, girlfriend at the time, and she's like, what did he say? He said, he said he wants to train with me. So I started training this guy every day, and because I started training this guy every day, it didn't hurt. Because I'm training him, all of a sudden people think I have all the answers, which I certainly don't, but it really, really helped my business, obviously. Um, and I started training other athletes, and it really blew up. And my goal at Equinox was, I didn't really care about, you know, Crush, crushing business at the time. I just talked to every single person, man. I want to know who your son was, who your daughter was, what problems you have, uh, what your son's going through struggles, whatever it was. I didn't even fucking care about training at the time. I was trying to meet as many people as possible and just get people to know me by having conversations that most people didn't want to be bothered for, with rather. So I'm at Equinox and one day I'm walking through the main floor and I had an, uh, I treated Equinox like it was my place, okay? I would clean it up, weights organized, someone didn't put weights away, forget about it. I wouldn't say anything, I would just clean it up myself and I'm walking through the main floor one day and I stopped and I turned around and I bent over and I picked up a little piece of paper and I put it in my pocket and I walked and I heard a guy say, hey! And I put my hand on my chest and said, are you talking to me? He said, yeah, I'm talking to you, come over here. And this guy was on the Stairmaster. So I walk over to the Stairmaster and I said, what's up? He goes, what the fuck are you doing? I said, well, this floor is a mess. I said, I was picking it up with my hands, but I'm going to try to find the vacuum to clean it up because it looks like shit. He goes, are you crazy? 
I said, no, I'm not crazy. I said, someone's got to do it. And apparently the person who has this for a job isn't doing a good job, so I'm going to do it. He said, I think someday we're going to be in business together. So this guy right here, his name is Randy Frankel. And uh, he's actually, um, he's my mentor. So find a mentor, uh, JL and Chris. This guy really, really helped me. He owns over 150 businesses. He owns a professional sports team. And he was like, dude, I don't care what you know. I'm investing in you. Just like your business, right? People don't care what you do, they care why you do it. I'll go one step further. They're buying you. They join because of you, because of your energy. They like who you are. In my business, if I was the trainer that is an al alcoholic, drinking, a mess, slob, not organized, drug problems, always a problem, dealing with crazy relationships and a mess and cheating on his wife, like, I wouldn't have a business. I don't know what the right thing is, but I'm always trying to do the right thing. Whatever that may be. Right for you and right for me is very different. But I'm always trying to do the right thing. So I told him I had an idea. And that idea was to create a facility that's like uh, a performance center and a global gym combined, but that's not really the main part. I said, it's going to be the best gym in America, though. He said, well, what kind of equipment are they going to have? I said, it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. He goes, what do you mean it doesn't matter? Of course it matters. I said, the, you've been a member here for three years. Your daughter's a member. Your wife's a member. Your other two daughters are members. Does the manager even say hello to you? No. Does he talk to you every day? No. Does he recognize that you're a huge part of the business? No. I said, that's why this place sucks. No one even treats you like you're special. No one's giving you support. No one's giving you that positive energy. You have to create, as we talked last night, JL, the culture. It's everything. That culture starts with you, how you carry yourself, how you behave, the way you do everything. The way you do one thing is the way you do all. It starts with you. If you have shitty culture, that's because of you. There are no bad teams, just bad leaders. This is me at uh, BPS. And man, I remember those days I was so tired. Friday night, 8 o'clock, man, I just slept face down on the rug. I was exhausted. <laughs> Defensive line drills. Okay, don't laugh. So, Joe knows this guy. I started to have a lot of great relationships with the athletes and the players. And it hit me hard that what we do is all about relationships. We know that. Are you nurturing those relationships? Are you paying attention to the people that look up to you? We had first rounders there. Jason Pierre Paul walked in the door. He looked like a superman. Everyone wanted to train him. People would always say, I want to train the best athletes. This kid was in the corner and they completely ignored him. And one day he's basically in tears and he says, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing because no one helps me. And he's paying for the fucking program. So I just started to work with him and I started to get on his ass. And if he fucked up, I'd make him do it again. If it was high knees, whatever it was. And I was literally talking to him the whole time. Right there he's about, I'm thinking, he said 315, he's probably about 325. <laughs> And in this picture, he's much lighter, but he was, uh, at the time when his transformation, he went to about 285, 287. And I just started to really, really help him. And it made me feel like, hey, if a guy walks in the door and he's projected first rounder, he's can, he can fall forward, not to discredit them, because they work hard too, but he could fall forward. He's going to be a first rounder. This kid is from a small school that no one thinks can walk and chew gum. Imagine if he got a shot playing the NFL. So as he's doing his high knees, doing his A running, and he's doing all the speed drills, I'm talking to him like, you're fast. It's like Apollo Creed. You're fast. You got this. You can do it. You're fast. You, you're lightning. You got this. Let's go, Tommy. You got this. You're, you're fast. You're, you're grease lightning. And he's kind of laughing, but he starts to believe it. And he became the ultimate transformation at BPS. 
So much where he got this. And he got a shot. He didn't make the team, but he got a shot. And this, this was his dream, just to get a shot, to feel it. And he felt it. And to this day, this guy's one of my best friends. Just because I decided to walk over to kid and give him a little bit more time. Just a little bit more time. And I can't tell you how hard he's worked for Mark Magna to help my business, branding, give me opportunities that no one else gets. It was incredible. So all of that story back up for this. We created the gym, Anatomy of 1220 in Miami Beach, Florida. This is the main floor. It's about 4,000 square feet. It's got everything. I know it's got a chandelier, I get it. I mean, it's Miami. What, that wasn't my part of the idea, but neither was this. Because these fucking columns, in between them, there's like little poles like as thick as this, and they eat space, so another nightmare. But you learn a lot your first time around. So we have 26 employees, group fitness, uh, vitamin IV, um, chiropractor, acupuncture, everything you possibly imagine, cold tub, hot, cold room, a steam room, sauna, we have everyone that comes in there and they come in there because they get treated like rock stars. I don't give a shit if you're Will Smith or you're the guy that waits tables at the local uh, uh, bar or restaurant. Everyone gets treated special because that's what we do. We're in the service business. I make sure that everyone has an incredible experience because that matters to me. Locker room. Did you look at the, the four pillars? I should have went a little bit fast. I'm getting rushed. But... These are four pillars of, of what we have at Anatomy and the most important things and why we have any bit of success. We went from having 16 members in our first month worrying about going out of business to 850 members now. And we do about anywhere from 55 to 65 personal training sessions a day. Culture, it starts with you. I said it before, they're not buying Anatomy, they're buying me. How I do things. It's all about, it's not kissing people's asses, it's treating people with respect. People don't want to be, you know, uh, they, they don't want to like call the shots and control you. They just want to be heard sometimes. Just paying attention to people is usually enough. How we treat each other. We have a lot of uh, team interactions. We have team meetings. We have front office meetings. We have continuing education development. We have presentations that everyone is responsible for doing. We have public speaking. We work on public speaking where we do table topics and they do impromptu speaking. There's a lot of in-house education that happens. But the most important thing is that it's a team culture. If you're not a team player, it's definitely not the place for you. This is on the door uh, to the staff room. Just very basic, when you come here, be honest, do your best, work with passion, treat everyone with respect. It's an absolute must. Hiring, are they consistent in their habits? So I don't hire them. I, I, my first year I hired everyone. Everyone in that building I hired. Now, the trainers on our staff, they hire them. I said, you're gonna have to deal with them, you hire them. So they sit down and they decide. They'll ask crazy questions. And they know, as JL said, remember we talked last night? They know what answers they're looking for. I tell you that right now. Because if they're not like-minded, they don't have a shot. I trust them to do the right thing. I trust them to do the right thing when I'm not around. That's the most important thing because I have a shit ton of responsibility. Anatomy number two is being built and we just uh, signed a lease for anatomy number three. I can't be there all the time. But if I can trust you to do the right thing when I'm not around, we're good. You're on a team. Are they in it for the right reasons? Look, I know Rachel talked about, it's not about the money, fuck money. I'm gonna be completely honest with you. When I first started, it wasn't about the money. Right now, this is the truth, write this down. I wanna make as much fucking money as possible. I'm gonna tell you right now, but let me tell you why. Because I'm gonna have a family someday and I want my son or daughter to have options. The options that I never had, okay? And the other reason is, I don't want to have to charge fucking everyone. I want to train this guy for free because he had a stroke. I want to train this little kid who busts his ass, who shows up at 6 a.m. Tuesday, Thursday, who drives an hour to be there. He wants to be a professional hockey player. He's 11 years old. I want to train those people for free. So I need to make as much money as possible. But I get it. There's a reason that we give shit away because we have to build first. We do what we have to do now so we can do what we want to do later. Team. Solutions. I don't deal with problems. I don't deal with complaints. If you have a problem, come with a solution. That's an in-house policy. Everyone knows that who works for me, with me. 
Are they always up to help others? If they just care about themselves, there's a big problem. There's a big problem. With training, team, we do one-on-ones with each other. We self-assess, we do uh, 360 meetings where you sit down in the middle of the room and it's a big circle and we air out our gripes. There's a big sign on the door that says, check your ego and emotions at the door and we let you have it. This is what I don't like. I don't like how you handle this. I don't like the way you talk to me. And we have it out. There's a lot of emotions in that room. There's crying, there's yelling, but at the end of the day, we're stronger for it. Um, my first gig was I sat down with every single person in the building and I found out what made them tick. And that took a lot of time, man, but it's a coffee or a lunch and I just get to know them inside out. I want to know what's important to them because I might not agree with them, but if they value it, I have to see some sort of value in it. Service. Uh, a few things. I know I'm, I got to rush. I'm going to rush, please. So. Gentleman comes in the gym, he wants to train. Shit, Mark, I can't train, I forgot my stuff at home. We send the, we'll send a trainer or a staff member to that guy's house to get his suit from his closet. We do it often. Uh, checking on homes during the hurricane. During the hurricane, we got every, all, everyone's information that lived in the bad area, and we checked on their homes. We just drove randomly to their homes and see if there was a tree through the roof or if they needed some sort of help or assistance. Uh, One-on-ones with members. I want the feedback, and most members won't tell you to your face. They're not going to say, hey, Mark, this sucks. You're going to say, that's great. I really appreciate that. Thank you. But say, give me something we really need to work on. Give me one takeaway we really need to work on. Who's the most important person in trainer-client relationship? I always say, the most important person in relationship, your, your family, your, light, your wife, your husband, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, client. It's not you. It's the other person. They're the most important person. Forget about yourself for five minutes. Having empathy, the ability to understand the feelings of others. Be understanding. If a client shows up hungover, I always hear this. I'm going to fucking hammer him. Man, I'm going to make sure he never does that shit again. What would you do if a client showed up hungover? Be honest. You'd be pissed, right? You'd be pissed. What if you found out his dad died last night? Changes things, right? You don't know the backside of it. I mean, if a guy shows up drunk all the time, that's different. But what I'm saying is... You don't know the other side of it. Don't assume like you do know. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Find out. This is uh, upstairs group fitness. We had Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon yoga uh, when the the sun went down. It was interesting. (sighs) I said it before. I swear, Alicia, I'm going to close this, please. No, you're good. All right. So... Leaders never cross the finish line first. People cross the finish line first are running alone. Leaders never cross the finish line first because when they come across, they're bringing people with them. That's uh, John Maxwell. And this is interesting because I always, early on in my life, it was like macho, football, be a warrior, beast mode. I'm going to fuck shit up. And I didn't even start to understand that someone else is standing in front of me till later on in my life. And I have to pay attention to other people. But this is what I started to under, pay attention to. And there was a reason I understand, because I was immature. Because I was immature. Immature people don't think about other, putting others first. They're immature because they think of themselves first. That's what makes them immature. So having the ability to self-assess and take a real deep look at who you are and how you act is important. Most people can't do it. They're like, no, man, I'm good. I don't have any flaws. This is our team. These are just uh, the floor trainers. We have uh, 12 other uh, trainers that are group fitness and outside. That was just me, uh, a maintenance worker saw me doing that and shot it to the gym. He said, why is Mark cleaning the floor? I said, because he didn't do it last night. The guy said he did it last night. So I checked the video. He said, I didn't see you do it. But I realized that when a few trainers saw me doing that when they walked in, then they started doing it. Because I realized that, you know, I get mad at these people. I say, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Why doesn't he do this? My mentor says, why didn't you tell him? Don't assume they know everything. You didn't know everything. I, needed, I had a lot of people helping me. I had a lot of people contributing to the growth of Mark Megna. I can't assume people know things. If I tell them and explain to them why, and then they don't do it, then we have a problem. But people, started to pay, people are paying attention to everything you do. It starts with you. Remember what I said? They buy you. 
This is just the kid. These are all videos, but these are just young kids from Texas that flew in. The parents flew them in. This is what I want to do more of. That's why I want to make money so I don't have to worry about it because I knew they couldn't afford it. They saved up their allowance to, uh, to train. This is Cedric. He said his dream was to, his dream, his fucking dream was to do a sled, a sled march in his wheelchair. I want to do more of this. It made him feel strong. It made him feel good. He said he felt alive, right? Just like uh, a Dick Hoyt in the sun. He said he felt alive because he could do what everyone else was doing. All right. That's, <laughs> that's my dog. I just wanted to, <laughs> I want to lighten it up, but this guy was found like half dead under like an expressway in Miami tied to a fence and we adopted him and he's been like the coolest thing in the world. But I want to spend more time with my family as well, Joe, right? We, the days are numbered. Right? We only get so much time. It's never enough. And my advice to, you know, what Joe said really resonated with me because he said, no matter what you do, it's never a perfect balance. Michael Jordan will tell you, I didn't fucking balance. I was obsessed with basketball. That was great. There's no balance. I try to have balance. Of course I do. But my wife yells at me too. My best advice for that is find a partner. Choose wisely. <laughs> Seriously. And treat kindly. Because if they kind of get it, that's a huge win. It's my wife. So, oh, by the way, a perk of having your, a business partner that owns a baseball team, you get to get married on the field. So, uh, trust me, it's not my car. I didn't even know how to drive it. So, <laughs> let me just say this, okay? I took, uh, this is my clothes here. All right. Think long and hard about how you want to spend the next 40 years of your life. Map that shit out. Write it down. Think about what the most important things are to you. Okay? Don't settle for a job or a profession or a career. Seek a calling. The fatigue will be easier to bear. The disappointments will be fuel. The highs will be like nothing you ever felt. I'm gonna ask you to participate in this last exercise for me, okay? This industry is all about people. The relationships you have with young people, with everyday people, you're the coach. The lessons you pass on and the bond you form with these people will help, you make, will help make your business work. Remember, when people say, it's all good, Mark, it's just business. Fuck that, it's never just business. If it's just business, Business isn't very good and you're going to have a big problem. Okay, I'm going to read this list and if any one of these statements applies to you, please participate. Stand up. If you use training as a means to build confidence as a kid, stand up. Come on, guys. If you sought out a coach because you needed a positive role model in your life, stand up. We might have to stop. It was up. Hold on. <laughs> If, you, if training transformed your body, stand up. If training earned you respect from others, stand up. If you turn to training as therapy at any point in your life, stand up. Is anyone sitting? Can I stop this? There's someone sitting in the back. Hold on. You might get them. If you realize training saved your life at any point, stand up. If training helped you be a better person, stand up. If you had a coach that you looked up to because he helped train you, stand up. If your gym community became your family and you could depend on all of them, stand up. So look who's standing up right now. You're the future. You're the future of this industry and the shit that you do matters. Think about that. Think about the impression you want to leave on other people. Think long and hard about it because everyone is watching you. Raise the bar. Make this industry better because the coaches in here right now are the people that are going to do it. Thank you, guys.